I would now like to present a speaker this evening who is well known to us all, Paola de Gregorio. Paola's subject tonight will be the Spanish-American War. Uh, unbeknownst to the board, when we were planning this talk, the Town Historical Commission was in the process of sponsoring a, a bronze plaque to commemorate the Foxborough citizens who participated in the war. And I invite you to look at the prototype artwork, which is uh, on the desk as you enter. And that, when it's finalized, that will be, the commission is going to make that. So, Paolo, it's over to you. Thank you. How is everybody doing this evening? Just move that back around so we don't get too much feedback. Um, tonight, we are going to dive into a discussion of the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War is kind of often overlooked in our history. It is in that period between the Civil War and the First World War. It's a relatively minor conflict in terms of um, the, how long it lasts but it is a, a majorly important conflict for what it leads to, um, what it creates in the aftermath of the war. Uh, it has been referred to as a splendid little war, which is where I get the, uh, the title of my talk. That phrase is actually coined by um, a man named John Hay. Does anybody know John Hay? At the time of this conflict in the late 19th century, he was the American ambassador in London. But during the Civil War, he was Abraham Lincoln's personal secretary. Um, so Hay was a, a mover and a shaker in American government and American politics in the second half of the 19th century. And he, observing this conflict from afar, from London, called it a splendid little war. Because, as we'll see moving forward in the story, it really was a, a neat and tidy conflict, or at least as neat and tidy as wars can be but the impact of it was monumental and it was global. So today we're gonna to dive into the story of this splendid little war talking about politics, the press, and the Spanish-American War. Now I do have to um, kind of preface this by saying this year, uh, 2023, is the 125th anniversary of the outbreak of the Spanish-American War. So we are kind of on an anniversary for this topic. Now, the story of the Spanish-American War, or to understand the story of the Spanish-American War, we have to think first of some of our early history. How many of you remember your early American history? I don't know how well. Sort of. Um, or your early European history. Uh, basically, we need to look at the Spanish Empire. Now, you may recall some guy named Christopher Columbus. That's a name that rings, that you remember from your history classes, good. Um, in 1492, as we know, all know, Christopher Columbus sails across the Atlantic Ocean, thinks he's going to Asia, but misses by a little bit and ends up on the islands in the Caribbean. Now that miscalculation by Columbus is significant because it does begin a process of European intervention, European interference in the New World, in the Americas over here. The Spanish, who, under whose flag Columbus was sailing, were the first ones to get here. And the Spanish begin to claim a lot of territory in the New World. In fact, uh, at one point, the Spanish Empire basically stretched from Northern California all the way down through Mexico, all the way down to the southern tip of Argentina. It was a tremendously huge chunk of land that belonged to Spain. In addition to controlling much of uh, North and South America, Spain also had possessions here in Africa, over there in the Philippines, and various islands across the world and across the Pacific. So by the middle of the 16th century, the 1550s or thereabouts, Spain had a vast global empire and was in fact the most powerful empire in Europe, probably the most powerful empire in the world. The Spanish monarchs, people like Philip II, were immensely wealthy because they had an almost limitless supply of silver and gold coming out of the Americas. So at its peak, Spain was a global power, was the great imperial power. Of course, what happens to the Spanish Empire? Over the centuries, it does begin to decline in size. But even at the beginning of the 19th century, around 1800 or so, Spain was still an important global power, controlling uh, Spain, much of southern Italy, much of what is today Latin America, islands across the Pacific, and the Philippines. That situation begins to change, however, by about 1810 or so. What happens then? Well, we begin to see the outbreak of revolution in Mexico. 
in places like Colombia and in places like Argentina, uh, across Latin America, there are revolutions that gain independence for those various countries, for those various states. The Spanish Empire is in a state of rapid decline by the 19th century. And by the time we get to the end of the century, 1898, the Spanish Empire is really a skeleton of what it once was. It's a shell of itself. By this point, the, what Spain controlled was obviously Spain, again, some islands, some territory in uh, Africa, a couple of islands here in the Caribbean, and the Philippines over there. The Spanish Empire was greatly reduced by this point. But it is here in this reduction of the Spanish Empire and kind of the dissolution of the Spanish Empire that the story of the Spanish-American War really begins. Because in two of those territories that were still controlled by the Spanish, there were independence movements. There were revolutions that were taking place. We can look at Cuba and the Philippines. Cuba in the Caribbean, the Philippines over in, uh, in Asia. These two areas that were still part of the Spanish Empire were struggling for their independence. The people in Cuba wanted to get rid of the Spanish. They wanted to establish themselves as an independent country. And the same thing in the Philippines. The Philippines wanted to break free from Spanish domination. So we see the Spanish struggling to hold on to their territories, to these possessions, and the people in the Philippines, the people in Cuba, pushing for their independence, for the creation of their own state. Now, for our purposes, for the beginning of this conflict, we're going to focus on Cuba. Why are we going to focus on Cuba? It was because that was where most American eyes were in the 1890s. Um, in 1895, in or about 1895, there is a Cuban War of Independence that breaks out. As Cuban revolutionaries are attempting to kick the Spanish off of the island and attempting to create an independent Spain, uh, independent Cuba, excuse me. Uh, here we see some scenes from that Cuban War of Independence. Uh, a revolutionary slogan is coined, Cuba Libre, which means what? <coughs> it means rum and coke. Uh, no, <laughs> the drink is actually named after this, not the other way around. Sorry to disappoint you. It means free Cuba or independent Cuba. What was the goal of this revolution? to have a, a free and independent Cuban state. So the Cuban revolutionaries begin to fight against the Spanish. They go into battle under this banner that we see here, the current Cuban flag, which uh, somewhat ironically was actually designed by an American in the 1850s. It's another part of the complication of the story. We won't, we won't get into that right now. But we see this revolution breaking out on the island of Cuba. Now, this is what drew a lot of American attention. Why were we concerned about what was happening in Cuba? Well, where is Cuba? It's right off the coast of Florida. They say it's about 90 miles off the coast of Florida. If you could drive there, you could get there in under an hour, well, depending on how quickly you drive. Uh, you could get there in about an hour, let's say. Um, it's very, very close to the United States. So the fact that you had this revolutionary event happening in our own backyard, very close to the shores of the United States, certainly drew the attention of the American government and of the American people. To compound matters, to make it more dramatic, there were news reports reaching the United States of Spanish atrocities being committed on the island. The Spanish, of course, wanted to hold on to those possessions, wanted to hold on to Cuba. And what were they doing with the revolutionaries? Well, the ones that they captured, they executed, as we see over here. The Spanish begin to uh, incarcerate whole villages in what are essentially concentration camps. There are accounts of the Spanish causing a mass famine on the island of Cuba to suppress revolution, to suppress this independence movement. And all of these news reports are kind of trickling into the United States. Another reason why Americans were very concerned about what was happening in Cuba was because American businesses were heavily invested on the island. We had invested, American businesses had invested millions and millions of dollars in Cuba. And there were several Americans living in Cuba in places like Havana. So the fact that you had this revolutionary turmoil taking place on the island, the fact that you had accounts of Spanish atrocities going on, the fact that you had American investments and American citizens in the island was greatly concerning for many people in the United States. We were um, cautious about what was happening there. We wanted to make sure that Cuba didn't become chaotic. The businessmen in particular didn't want to lose their investments. And most Americans were concerned about, well, 
how, why are the Spanish being so mean to the Cubans? So we have this beginning of an American interest in Cuba, an American general public interest in what's going on in Cuba. Now, part of that concern with Cuba was certainly fed by the press, the newspapers at the time. Now, in the late 19th century, there were two uh, newspaper barons who had media empires that stretched across the country. You had William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. You've probably heard of both of their names. At their height, they controlled most of the major newspapers across the United States in cities and small towns. They, um, they controlled what the American people learned of foreign events and what was happening in other parts of the world. Well, if you control a media empire and you want to kind of grow your industry, grow your enterprise, what do you need to do? Well, you need to sell newspapers. And how do you sell newspapers? You scare people, you get people upset, you need headlines. You need dramatic headlines so that people will run out and buy the evening newspaper or the morning newspaper or the, the tabloid that you print or whatever. So what we see is that both Hearst and Pulitzer began to realize that these stories that are coming out of Cuba are catching the public interest. And if we can figure out how to magnify those stories, that'll be good for business. That will sell lots and lots of newspapers. So what we see are that both Hearst and Pulitzer begin to print more and more sensational headlines and more and more dramatic stories and more tales of Spanish atrocities and more tales of the heroism of the Cubans. Essentially, they are trying to sell newspapers. And in doing this, and in, uh, in uh, telling these stories and publicizing these stories, they are, in a way, encouraging American intervention in the island. Because really, what sells newspapers? War. War will certainly catch the public imagination, will sell lots and lots of newspapers. So we see Hearst and Pulitzer engaging in what comes to be called yellow journalism, this kind of hyper-nationalist, uh, nationalistic narrative um, highlighting the, the drama, highlighting the, the atrocities of the island, trying to sell lots and lots of, uh, of papers. Um, the term yellow journalism actually evolves in this time period. It develops in this time period of the late 1890s. And it refers to a popular cartoon character of the day, a character called the Yellow Kid, who was this kind of young impish child who was constantly getting into um, various misadventures and scrapes in, in his cartoons. Uh, the yellow kid often wore a yellow cloak like this. So what we see over here are uh, Pulitzer and Hearst depicted as the yellow kid stacking up their building blocks. And what do they happen to be spelling there on their building blocks? War. War. They were beating the drum for intervention in Cuba. They wanted to sell papers and, of course, if it bleeds, it leads, as the, uh, the common news maxim says. So they were looking to, to increase their business while pushing this nationalist uh, agenda, getting the United States involved in Cuba, though we didn't really want to get directly involved in Cuba. Yet what we begin to see in the press are tales of Spanish atrocities and these these visions of the, uh, the poor Cubans suffering under Spanish domination. And in fact, many other press agencies across the United States begin to take that narrative and create images that shape American public opinion. What we see here are a collection of cartoons from some of the, the weekly newspapers, weekly magazines of the time period that depicted the growing point of view of many Americans in regard to Cuba. What we have here um, is a depiction of Cuba, always depicted as a fair, helpless maiden here, running from the uh, dastardly Spaniards over here, coming through the jungle. And who is sheltering and protecting Cuba? Well, look, it's Uncle Sam, draping the American flag around her shoulder. Same thing going on in this image over here. This is much more theatrical. They're on a stage setting. And you have, again, that dastardly Spanish theatrical villain with his dark cloak and his grand mustache, and the fair maiden Cuba bowing down, kneeling down at the feet of a um, stars and striped bedecked Uncle Sam, this big feathered hat. Uh, 
So there was this growing American perception that we, the United States, had to do something to help the Cuban people, that we had to intervene on behalf of Cuba against the evil Spaniards, these Spanish atrocities that were being committed. There was another point of view that many in the United States were beginning to develop, particularly businessmen, but also some politicians. And that's depicted in this cartoon over here. What we see here is again, uh, Cuba depicted as that fine uh, young maiden carrying the Cuban flag, and she's standing in the Spanish, uh, the frying pan of Spanish misrule. Now, what's the old saying about this, the frying pan? Out of the frying pan and into the fire. So here she is in the frying pan of Spanish misrule. If the Spanish are gone, young lady Cuba is going to fall into this fire over here. And what does the fire say? You might not be able to make it out, but it says anarchy. So what's worse, the frying pan or the fire? This was a grave concern for many American businessmen because if the Cubans manage to gain their independence on their own and they get out of that Spanish frying pan, will they, they fall into that fire of anarchy? Will Cuba descend into anarchy? And anarchy, of course, is not good for business. So there was incredible American concern of what was happening on the island of Cuba. There was humanitarian concern. There was uh, financial concern. There was concern for the Americans that were living in Cuba. American eyes were clearly on events that were going on on that island. Well, the uh, Cuban War of Independence begins in 1895, continues for a few years into the later 1890s. 1896 is an, a presidential election year in the United States. And the issue of Cuba really wasn't on the... Um, the, the table for campaigning in that year. The United States was in the midst of an economic crisis, an economic downturn during that presidential election. So that was really the overwhelming issue in the election. But when the votes are taken and the electoral college meets, it is William McKinley, who is ultimately, ultimately elected president in 1896, taking office in 1897. Now, McKinley's main concern had to do with the gold standard, and um, I don't know if any of you really like 18, late 1800s um, economics. It's deathly boring. Uh, I would put myself to sleep if I went too far into it. But things like the gold standard and monetary policy and that sort of stuff were what dominated. McKinley wasn't really thinking about Cuba. Yet once he was president, and as the Cuban War of Independence went deeper and deeper into uh, perceived chaos, there starts to be pressure put on the president, pressure by the press, by the American public, by American business interests. We have to do something about Cuba. We have to intervene. Uh, Cuba is going to descend into anarchy, and that's bad for everybody involved. And McKinley really doesn't want to do anything. He does not want to get involved in Cuba at all. He sees Cuba as a Spanish problem. It's part of the Spanish empire. That is an internal affair of Spain. The United States should not be involved there, even though Cuba is right on our doorstep and even though American money is invested in the island. McKinley doesn't want to get involved in Cuba. Yet over the course of 18, uh, 1897, going into early 1898, as more and more stories of atrocities are coming, as, as Hearst and Pulitzer are publicizing and, and dramatizing what's happening on the island of Cuba as the businessmen in the United States are growing more and more concerned about losing their investments in Cuba. There is increased pressure on President McKinley. So much so that by early 1898, McKinley decides he has to do something. He has to kind of get this pressure off of him, domestic pressure off of him. He has to at least make a show that he is concerned about what's happening on the island of Cuba. So he asks the Spanish government for permission to send an old American battleship to Havana. The idea behind this was that it would show Americans, uh, the Americans living in Cuba and Americans who had invested in Cuba, that the government was paying attention to what was happening on the island, that the United States was keeping an eye on Cuba, but we weren't directly involved. It was still a, a Spanish problem. So what happens late January, an old battleship, the USS Maine, is dispatched to Havana Harbor. Now this is a, a fantastic photograph because what we see is the Maine right there in the middle, 
actually entering Havana Harbor. You can see the old fortress there, the old Spanish fortress that protected the harbor itself. The Maine arrives in Havana and it anchors there in the middle of the harbor and you know McKinley is kind of uh, satisfying his critics at home. Look, I did something. He is trying to calm those Americans that are in Cuba and he's doing this without really ruffling the feathers of the Spanish too much. The United States is concerned, but we're not directly involved is essentially what the main represented. So we've made that step. We've made that, that pr our presence known about what is happening in Cuba. The affairs in Cuba are certainly on the American radar at this time. Well, what happens to the main? Yes. On the night of February 15th, an explosion destroys the main, as you see dramatically illustrated in the uh, print over there. The center photograph shows the aftermath of the main sitting in Havana Harbor. Um, the main explodes. The explosion of the main kills nearly 300 American sailors, and it causes an international crisis because many people in the United States, particularly Pulitzer and Hearst, immediately blame the Spanish for destroying the main. As you can see here, destruction of the warship Maine was the work of an enemy. Um, the Spanish, of course, say, we had nothing to do with this. This was not us. Uh, and McKinley, again, who doesn't really want to get drawn into anything in Cuba, kind of decides, you know, we need to, we need to investigate. So a naval commission is established. They are sent down to Havana to investigate the wreck of the Maine. That naval commission doesn't come up with a definitive answer. They can't really figure out what sank the Maine. So what's happening in the United States is there, there is open discussion. The press is saying it was obviously Spain that did it. Spain doesn't want us there. Spain is uh, evil. Look what they're doing to the Cubans, that sort of thing. The Spanish are insisting it wasn't us. Spain does not want to go to war with the United States. And McKinley's kind of caught in the middle, but he begins to feel more and more pressure. Uh, again, the businessmen, the public, the press, and now the politicians are starting to put more and more pressure on uh, William McKinley to do something about the Maine, to remember the Maine, to avenge the Maine, however we want to term it. Ultimately, what happens? Well, in April of 1898, McKinley does go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war against the Spanish. The political pressure on him forces his hand. Uh, what we see here are excerpts from McKinley's war message. He says, The fire of insurrection more, may flame or may smolder with varying seasons, but it has not been, and it is plain that it cannot be, extinguished by present methods. There he's talking about what the Spanish are doing to the Cubans uh, on the island itself. In the name of humanity, in the name of civilization, in behalf of endangered American interests, which give us the right and the duty to speak, and to act, the war in Cuba must stop. So that's a statement directly to the Spanish. He then continues, I ask the Congress to authorize and empower the president to take measures to secure a full and final termination of hostilities uh, between the government of Spain and the people of Cuba and to secure in the island the establishment of a stable government and to use the military and naval forces of the United States as may be necessary for those purposes. He's asking Congress to grant him permission to send military forces to the island of Cuba to fight against the Spanish. So McKinley delivers this message to Congress uh, on April 11, 1898. And of course, Congress has to take the issue up. They have to debate the issue. There was some concern among members of Congress that the declaration of war would be used by the United States as a means of uh, acquiring the island of Cuba of just outright annexing the island. Um, that had been attempted before in the 1850s. Uh, and that first attempt to annex Cuba by the United States do isn't successful. So there was a concern again that, is this just a pretense to get American troops on the ground to just take control of the island? So that was uh, part of the debate that was taking place in Congress. Ultimately, however, a, uh, a compromise is reached and an amendment is added to the declaration of war that comes to be called the Teller Amendment. Uh, senator Henry Teller, who we see over here, was a, a senator from Colorado. And the Teller Amendment essentially said that the United States had no territorial interests in Cuba, that we were only getting involved on the island to help the Cuban people gain their independence from, uh, from Spain. Uh, 
So you can see the uh, Teller Amendment in the Declaration of War over here. First, that the people of the island of Cuba are and of right ought to be free and independent. Statement of Cuban independence right there. Second, that it is the duty of the United States to demand, and the government of the United States does hereby demand, that the government of Spain at once relinquish, relinquish its authority and government in the island of Cuba and withdraw its land and naval forces from Cuba and Cuban waters. We're telling the Spanish to get out of the island. Part three, uh, the third says the president of the United States be and is hereby is directed and empowered to use the entire land and naval forces of the United States. We're sending troops to uh, enforce those first two parts. And then that last part, which is the Teller Amendment part, the United States hereby disclaims any disposition or intention to exercise sovereignty, jurisdiction, or control over said island, except for the pacification thereof, and asserts its determination when that is accomplished to leave the government in control of the island to its people. So the Teller Amendment basically says, we're gonna go, we're gonna get the Spanish out, we're gonna help establish law and order on the island, and then we're leaving. We don't want, we are not going to interfere with the Cuban people. We will let the Cubans govern, them, govern themselves. With that amendment added to this declaration of war, Congress does formally declare war on Spain. The United States has just declared war on the Spanish Empire. Now, Spain really has no choice but to reciprocate, and they shortly thereafter declare war on the United States. And just like that, the Spanish-American War has begun. Now, the first major action of the Spanish-American War doesn't take place in, the, in, in Cuba. In fact, it takes place on the other side of the world, in the Philippines. The Philippines were still part of the Spanish Empire. Um, but remember, you had the Filipinos who were fighting against Spanish uh, rule in, on the islands. Now, on May 1st, 1898, the first major fighting of the Spanish-American War occurs at the Battle of Manila Bay. Manila is the capital of the Philippines. Uh, Manila Bay is the bay near Manila. You can see that there on the map. Uh, what occurs on May 1st, 1898, is that the American Pacific Fleet, um, knowing that war has been declared, sails into Manila Bay and basically destroys the Spanish fleet that was at anchor there in the bay. Now, why was the Spanish fleet at anchor? Because news of war had not yet reached Manila. Uh, the, the Spanish in the Philippines did not know that war had been declared. So the, the American fleet sails in, they destroy the Spanish fleet, and then begin to land troops on the island here outside of Manila. Uh, the Spanish are caught completely by surprise by this action. This is the first uh, military action of the Spanish-American War. Accompanying the American fleet into the Philippines were several Filipino revolutionaries and revolutionary leaders, people who had been exiled from the Philippines by the Spanish. One of those was a man named Emilio Aguinaldo. Aguinaldo was perhaps the most important of the Filipino revolutionary leaders during this time period. He had been active in fighting against the Spanish. Um, and when the United States was about to go to war with Spain, we picked up some of these Cuban revolutionary leaders and said, hey, you already have men on the island. You already know the terrain. Why don't you come? We'll help you get rid of the Spanish. So Aguinaldo comes along and arrives in the Philippines with the American fleet and with American soldiers and goes and reorganizes his uh, Filipino revolutionaries, and they continue to fight against Spain in the islands and besiege the city of Manila. So a lot of the early action in the Spanish-American War actually takes place far away from Cuba, which was the reason why war was declared in the first place. A lot of the action takes place there in the Philippines. Now, Aguinaldo himself is really kind of a, an interesting character. He looms really large in the history of the modern Philippines. Um, you can see he lives almost 100 years. He dies in uh, 1964. So he is there for a, a, a hugely transformative period of Filipino history. Uh, he's born as a subject of the Spanish Empire. He witnesses the independence of the Philippines or the, or the American occupation of the Philippines, witnesses the independence of the Philippines, is there for the Japanese occupation during the Second World War, and then the post-war period of the Philippines. He is an eyewitness to all of that. He plays large roles in many of those chapters of Filipino history. Uh, of course, he's somewhat of a controversial figure because he is involved in all different aspects of the story, but he is a, an important figure in the history of the Philippines themselves. In the meantime, while this is going on in the Philippines, we're getting ready to fight the Spanish in Cuba. Now, you would think getting to Cuba would be relatively easy. 
It's 90 miles off the coast of the United States, not like the Philippines thousands of miles away. But there's a problem. Florida at that time wasn't really built up, and there weren't really any rail yards or many harbors that had the facilities to move large numbers of tro troops and equipment. Miami really didn't exist at that time. So the only place where there were the, the combination of good port facilities and rail junctions was Tampa, Tampa Bay. So what we see happening is that troops from across the United States have to be transported to Tampa to be put on ships to be shipped to Cuba. So what we have is essentially a pinch point in the entire process of getting troops to the island of Cuba. Military units from across the United States, um, regular military troops and lots of militia units, state militias and private militias are descending on Cuba. They're showing up with all of their equipment and all of their horses, and the, excuse me, descending on Tampa, uh, showing up there with all of their equipment and all of their horses, and then they're basically stuck there. Um, they are waiting for enough ships to come to actually transport them to the island uh, with an, enough men to show up so that they can actually be a, an effective fighting force once they arrive there. So what you begin to see is a glut of men and horses and equipment gathering at Tampa and no place for them to go. Now at this time, 1889, excuse me, 1898, Tampa wasn't much of a town. There really wasn't much there. There were some harbor facilities, there were some rail lines, a few scattered houses, and it was surrounded by swamp. Now, what lives in swamps? Alligators. alligators, but even more deadly than alligators, mosquitoes. Snakes are creepy, but not so deadly. Mosquitoes. What you end up having is a lot of men, thousands and thousands of men, and thousands and thousands of horses and mules and other animals gathered in a very swampy area where there are lots of mosquitoes. And what do those mosquitoes do? Well, they have a feast. The mosquitoes are eating well, they're making lots of little baby mosquitoes, which are then going out and eating well, and you see lots of tropical diseases suddenly appearing among all of the American troops that are stuck there at Tampa. It takes several weeks before enough ships are organized and gathered, and enough men have arrived at Tampa before we can actually begin getting to Cuba. So though we declare war in April, it, we don't get to the island of Cuba until the middle of June. The first two places where American troops arrive in Cuba are at a place called Guantanamo Bay on the eastern end of the island and another place called Daiquiri. Want to tell us what a daiquiri is? <laughs> um, a daiquiri is a fruit-based rum beverage named after this town in Cuba. Uh, these are the two landing sites for many of the American troops when they do finally arrive on the island after that logistical nightmare of Tampa Bay. So we eventually do get fighting troops on the ground on the island of Cuba, and they do slowly begin to engage with the Spanish that are defending the island. Um, there's really not a lot of fighting that takes place early on. It's very limited in terms of the amount of combat that actually occurs on the island of Cuba. The Spanish are trying to hold on to some of their fortifications, some of their fortified positions. The Americans are landing at Daiquiri and Guantanamo Bay and building up their supplies and building up their forces. Now, among the American troops that were arriving in Cuba were, as I said, many state militias and many private militias. Um, this was a period in the United States where you had a lot of wealth, industrial wealth, concentrated in very few hands. You had the robber barons. And the robber barons wanted to be seen as patriotic, but they weren't going to put on uniforms and go fight against the Spanish. Instead, what many of the robber barons did was they supplied militia units. They paid for, organized, equipped, and shipped them away. One of the uh, robber barons, one of the, the millionaires of the day that does this, is um, John Jacob Astor IV. Uh, one of the wealthiest men in the United States at that time, he organizes a militia unit that was ostensibly supposed to be sent to Cuba to fight against the Spanish. That militia unit that Astor organizes ends up being crisscrossing the United States several times by rail. It's okay, Astor owned the railroad, so it wasn't costing him anything. Uh, and they eventually end up getting shipped to the Philippines to fight there. But it was one of those private units paid for by wealthy American, a wealthy American as kind of his patriotic duty. Incidentally, does anybody know what happens to uh, Astor, John Jacob Astor IV? Goes down. goes down in the Titanic. He's the, supposedly the wealthiest person to die in that tragedy in 1912. 
Uh, during the Spanish-American War, he does organize this militia unit. He gets the honorary title of Colonel and is known for the rest of his life as Colonel Astor. Uh, another militia unit that does eventually make its way to Cuba was organized in New York State. It was actually the first New York State Cavalry that uh, was originally under the command of Colonel Leonard Wood. Uh, Wood, however, gets a promotion to Brigadier General, and command of that militia unit falls to a um, ambitious young a representative of a prominent New York family by the name Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt, uh, the Roosevelt family, is one of the oldest and most distinguished, distinguished New York families, uh, going back to the Dutch uh, colonization of New York in the Hudson River Valley. Teddy Roosevelt was a man of action. He could not sit still. Uh, he had to be doing something all the time. Um, he read voraciously, he wrote all the time, he was constantly in motion, and he saw war with Spain as something that was good for the United States, something that was good for the nation. It was a grand adventure, it was a way to strengthen the youth of the country, it was beneficial for the country as a whole. After all, the United States really hadn't been involved in a big war since the 1860s, since the end of the Civil War. Sure, we had been doing a lot of fighting on the American frontier, but those were relatively small and scattered battles across the interior of the United States. We didn't have this dramatic, heroic action that Teddy Roosevelt so desired, so he was one of those who advocated going to war with Spain, and he was very excited when war was declared. He signs up to be an officer in this militia. It becomes his unit, and it gets nicknamed the Rough Riders. Uh, the Rough Riders were supposed to be a mounted infantry unit. They were supposed to have horses. But when they arrive in Cuba, guess what? Their horses didn't make the trip. They were still back in Tampa. So you have the Rough Riders uh, ending up in Cuba without their horses, but they are going to be in the action. They are going to be involved in fighting against the Spanish. Now, uh, I do have to mention a couple of things about Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt was politically ambitious, and he was very well connected in New York City. He had lots of friends who were in the press, reporters and photographers. So when Teddy Roosevelt was getting ready to go off to war in a uniform that he designed himself, by the way, he made sure that he brought some of his friends in the press with him so that they could cover his exploits and take pictures of him like this and pictures of the Rough Riders here. That's Teddy Roosevelt right in the, under the American flag there in the center so that his name, his face would be known in New York and to the broader American public. Roosevelt certainly had ambitions beyond just fighting the Spanish, and he kind of um, made sure that those ambitions would be satisfied once he returned to the United States. So Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, other American military units finally arrive in Cuba and begin to engage the Spanish. The big battle, the most important battle that takes place in Cuba, certainly the most celebrated one, occurs on July 1st, 1898, at a place called San Juan Hill. Now, um, I do have to point out that the battle itself was not actually fought on San Juan Hill. It was fought on Kettle Hill, which was right next door. Uh, we have some familiarity with that here in Massachusetts, don't we, with the Battle of Bunker Hill, which wasn't fought on Bunker Hill. It was fought on Breed's Hill. Um, apparently, we don't do good with naming our battles after hills. In any case, at San Juan Hill, what occurred, what was happening was that the Spanish were in a blockhouse, a fortified blockhouse up at the top of the hill, and the Americans wanted to get the Spanish off out of that position. So what we see is a, an infantry assault on this Spanish blockhouse, up the slopes of Kettle Hill toward San Juan Hill. The Spanish put up a very, very stout defense. In fact, the initial American assault, of which the Rough Riders were a part, is pinned down. It is not successful. The American troops, Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, are stuck on the slopes of the hill. They can't go up, they can't go down, they're basically stuck there, pinned down by Spanish fire. This is actually a photograph of the battlefield in the aftermath of the battle. That's how the situation remains for some time. The Spanish holding the ground, American forces pinned down on the side until American reinforcements showed up. Among the American reinforcements that showed up that engaged the Spanish and allowed the Rough Riders and others to make their way up the hill were divisions of Buffalo soldiers. Now, who were Buffalo soldiers? They were African-American soldiers who had, uh, had gained military experience in the, the Indian Wars of the West, fighting against the Native Americans. There we see some of the uh, Buffalo soldiers that fought at San Juan Hill. It's because of the arrival of these reinforcements, including the Buffalo soldiers, that Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, do finally make it up to the top of the hill, do finally manage to displace 
the Spanish from the top of the hill and do gain victory at the Battle of San Juan Hill. Um, however, what's reported in the press? Teddy Roosevelt charges up the hill with the Rough Riders. They chase the Spanish out, the glorious Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he gains tremendous acclaim and fame from his endeavors there. Well, the loss of San Juan Hill really jeopardized the entire Spanish position in Cuba. Uh, Havana was now vulnerable, and the Spanish decide that they need to, to get out. The Spanish fleet, the Spanish Navy in, in the Caribbean, was based in Cuba. The Spanish admirals in charge decide we have to go. We cannot hold on here any longer. We have to make a run for it. So what we see two days after San Juan Hill on July 3rd is that the Spanish fleet does try to escape. They come, they're here in this secluded, secure harbor, and they have to make a run through this narrow passageway out into the Caribbean to try to get out of Cuba, to try to make it out into the Atlantic Ocean to eventually get back to Spain. But as the Spanish fleet comes out through that narrow passageway, who is out here? American. The American fleet. And what happens when the Spanish fleet encounters the American fleet? It was a little bit more of a battle than what happened at Manila Bay, but the Spanish fleet is soundly defeated. Uh, the American Navy destroys the Spanish Navy there at Santiago Bay. And just like that, between San Juan Hill and Santiago Bay, the Spanish hold on Cuba essentially evaporates. Um, the Spanish can no longer hold on to the island. And in fact, what we begin to see is that in uh, Europe, Spanish diplomats begin opening up negotiations with American diplomats to, to end this conflict. Spain sues for peace and negotiations begin to take place to settle this conflict. Now at the same time, or shortly after, Cuba has essentially been um, freed from the Spanish, we still are dealing with the issues going on in the Philippines. The United States had arrived in the Philippines. We had destroyed the Spanish fleet. American troops were on the ground. Filipino insurrectionists or revolutionaries were helping the American troops. But the Spanish still held on to Manila. And Manila was the symbolic heart of the Philippines. As long as the Spanish were in Manila, they could still claim to have the Philippines. So what we begin to see is that as American forces are closing in on Manila, as the revolutionary, the Cuban... Uh, Filipino revolutionaries are closing in on Manila. The Spanish realize that we can't really hold the city anymore. And what they do is they enter into secret negotiations with the Americans. Now, why do they enter into secret negotiations with the Americans? Because the Spanish did not want to see the Filipinos capture Manila. They thought that that would be unseemly to have this subject people, this people that they thought were, were less than civilized, be the ones to defeat the Spanish empire. To, to topple Spanish hold of the Philippines. So the, the, the Spanish did not want to see the Filipinos entering the city first. And frankly, the Americans didn't want to see the Filipinos entering Manila. So the Spanish begin negotiating with the American forces there. And on August 13th, the Spanish garrison at Manila surrenders to the American troops besieging the city. The Americans march in, they raise the stars and stripes above the fortress of Manila and the Spanish hold on the Philippines has ended. The Filipino revolutionaries are left out of this. They are still outside of the city. They are not included in this surrender ceremony. They are not part of the capture of Manila. Uh, as you might guess, that does leave a bad taste in their mouth. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, at the same time that the, the fall of Manila was being negotiated between Spain and the United States, there's another territorial acquisition um, that, that the United States undertakes that really doesn't have anything to do with the Spanish-American War other than that it happens at the exact same time. It is right before, the day before Manila is captured, that the Hawaiian Islands are formally annexed to the United States. Now, what is the story with Hawaii? Hawaii had, for much of its history, been an independent kingdom. There had been kings and queens that ruled over the Hawaiian Islands. And what we see in the 19th century is that American corporations had begun to invest in the Hawaiian Islands, particularly American fruit corporations, like the Dole Corporation. Now, why would the Dole Fruit Company be interested in Hawaii? 
perfect weather for growing fruit. Uh, the doles begin to plant pineapples in Hawaii, and then they harvest those pineapples and can them and ship them to the United States, and they amass a tremendous fortune in, um, in the fruit industry. Well, the Hawaiian governments, the royal governments of Hawaii, had grown somewhat less friendly to these American business interests by the 1890s. And relations between the doles and others and the Hawaiian government were pretty much deteriorating. So what happens? Well, those American businessmen in Hawaii essentially launch a coup d'etat. They overthrow the Hawaiian monarchy. The last queen of Hawaii, Queen Lili Kuliani, is forced to go into exile and a Hawaiian Republic is declared. Well, who's the head of that Hawaiian Republic? One Sanford Dole, head of the Dole Fruit Corporation. Uh, essentially what we see is an illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian government, the establishment of a, uh, a a, a corporate dominated Hawaiian Republic and hopes by the businessmen, the American businessmen in Hawaii, that the American government will annex the island. Well, that doesn't happen immediately because the way that the Hawaiian government was overthrown leaves kind of a, uh, a bad taste in the mouth of many American politicians and the presidents, the politicians in Washington, though they, you know, aren't necessarily known for their upstanding moral behavior, had a problem with the way that the Queen of Hawaii was overthrown. So for a brief period, you have Sanford Dole as the head of state of this Hawaiian Republic. Well, by the time we get to 1898 and the United States is engaged in the Spanish-American War and we're fighting a two ocean war, um, Hawaii becomes strategically important for the United States. Hawaii is right in the middle of the Pacific and it seems like a good place to have some naval bases. Plus, you know, there's good surfing there and the weather's kind of nice. So uh, ultimately, Dole gets what he wants and the United States does annex the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, here, this upper image, you see the American flag being raised in front of the former royal palace in Honolulu. And that cartoon there on the bottom uh, shows essentially a forced marriage uh, between the lovely uh, native Hawaii over there on the right and a kind of uh, reluctant looking Uncle Sam being led to the altar by one William McKinley. Hawaii becomes property of the United States in August of 1898. Now this entire process of the annexation of Hawaii um, is still resented by many native Hawaiians, which is quite understandable because Hawaii had been independent and suddenly they're not. Um, and it, there was a lot of backstabbing and trickery that was involved in the annexation of Hawaii. But on August 12th, it does become part of the United States. And the following day, American troops enter into Manila. And ultimately, it looks like the Spanish-American War is rapidly ending. Spain has sued for peace. Negotiations are underway. And in December of 1898, a treaty is signed in Paris, formally ending the Spanish-American War. Now, if you study any history... Um, and you talk about the Treaty of Paris, you have to be very specific because it seems like every other war, every other conflict in Europe ends by some sort of treaty that is signed in Paris. And it does raise the question, why does everybody go to Paris to negotiate the ends of their conflicts? Well, who's negotiating these conflicts? Usually diplomats. They're leaving home, leaving their wives and kids behind. You want to go someplace where, you know, the food's good, the wine's good, the women are pretty. Let's go to Paris. And you see lots of treaties that are signed in Paris over the course of history. The treaty that ends the American Revolutionary War, signed in Paris in 1783. The treaty that ends the, uh, the, uh, the French and Indian War, signed in Paris in 1763. It's a whole series of these. So the Treaty of Paris is signed in 1898, in December of 1898, bringing the Spanish-American War to an end. Now what, what is the result of that? What happens in the Treaty of Paris? Well, this cartoon, a very um, bold and colorful cartoon, kind of hints at what occurs as a result of the Paris of Treaty. Uh, Treaty of Paris. What you see here is a belligerent Uncle Sam wielding his saber, pounding his fist on the Treaty of Peace, toppling over the rather elaborately dressed Spaniard over there. And in the background, you see the American flag being raised all over the place, in Puerto Rico, in Cuba, over, the, over Hawaii, in Guam. What happens as a result of the treaty? The United States acquires much of what was once Spanish territory. We inherit large parts of the former Spanish Empire. Now, as the treaty was being signed, as the war itself was coming to an end, 
a contemporary observer, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Anybody know what state Henry Cabot Lodge was from? <laughs> yeah, uh, Massachusetts. Um, gives a, a on-the-spot assessment of the war. He said that the war of the United States with Spain was very brief. Its results were many, startling, and of worldwide meaning. The war itself, lasted, the fighting in the war, lasted about 10 weeks. Remarkably brief struggle. American casualties in the Spanish-American War totaled about 3,000. 90% of those were from disease. Only about 300 American casualties were due to action with the Spanish. Um, again, the Tampa effect, I guess we could call it. And what was the part that was startling and uh, of worldwide meaning? Well, the United States acquires a global empire. As a result of the Spanish-American War, the Spanish empire is destroyed and an American empire is born. We acquire possession of Puerto Rico. We acquire possession of the Philippines. We acquire Guam. We've picked up Hawaii along the way, though not from Spain. We have become a global power with possessions around the world. You can see them uh, depicted there on that bill of fare at uh, President McKinley's restaurant where he's uh, feeding Uncle Sam. Uh, you can also see it highlighted here in this lower image with the eagle um, saying 10,000 miles from tip to tip. The American empire now stretches 10,000 miles across the globe. That last image over there um, from the cover of Puck magazine celebrates the fact that the United States has now become a global power. What you see is Colombia. Colombia is a uh, sometimes stand-in for the United States, kind of the female Uncle Sam, if you will. Uh, and she is wearing her finest bonnet. And if you look at the hat she's putting on, what does it look like? It looks like a battleship, and it actually says world power on it. And then the, the feather coming off of it that looks like the smoke from the smokestack has the word expansion written into it. The United States has become a global empire. We have become an imperial power. Much like Britain, much like France, like Italy, like Belgium, we have possessions that now span the globe. We have become one of those great powers. That is one of the immediate results of the Spanish-American War, the construction development of this American empire. Of course, the uh, acquisition of this territory does provide other opportunities for the United States. One opportunity that many people wanted to take advantage of was building a canal through Central America. Um, we see that over here, William McKinley rolling up his sleeves and grabbing the pickaxe, about to dig a tunnel through, or a, a slit through South, uh, Central America to connect the Atlantic and the Pacific. Now, this was deemed as something that was vitally important for the United States, because now we were not only a two ocean country, but we were a two ocean empire. We had possessions in the Atlantic, possessions in the Pacific. We had to be able to move ships and goods and equipment very quickly from one side of the world to the other. So there was a growing call for the construction of a canal somewhere in Central America. Now, the idea of a Central American canal had existed for almost 500 years at this point. The earliest Spanish explorers who reached Central America thought we should build a canal here. That makes perfect sense. Of course, they didn't have the technology in the 16th century. Uh, by the time we get to the 19th century, there are attempts to build a canal in Central America. The French had attempted it. Uh, the French effort fails miserably. There's a, a financial disaster. Lots of people in France end up in prison. Uh, somebody involved in that was a guy named um, Eiffel. You might have heard of him. He builds a tower in Paris later on. He actually gets in trouble for his involvement in the, uh, the French effort to build the canal. So there is this desire to build a canal in Central America, but there are politics that have to be in play and engineering that has to come into play. So McKinley, uh, the people want McKinley to build the canal. He doesn't get to build the canal. That will happen a little bit later on. Another important development is that the American acquisition of the Philippines gave us a stepping stone into China. At this time, China was still an imperial state. You had an emperor of China who ruled over the Chinese empire, but the Chinese empire was very obviously in decline. Over the course of the 19th century, China had gotten involved in, in a series of wars with Western powers and had been defeated in those wars with Western powers. They had lately been defeated by Japan. China was an empire that was crumbling, yet China was a place of um, vast economic opportunity. There were lots of natural resources there, lots of people that lived there. There was a hope that the United States 
could get into the Chinese market and that we could sell American made goods into China and we could take the natural resources from China and bring them to the United States. And that's what we see depicted in that cartoon over there. You have Uncle Sam loaded down with steel rails and farm equipment and Bibles and other things, stepping from the United States to the Philippines, heading into the great unknown of China. There was economic opportunity that was afoot uh, as a result of the, the victory in the Spanish-American War. Again, that's something that would take a little bit more time to develop that, that uh, involvement in China. In the immediate aftermath of the Spanish-American War, however, the United States does find itself in kind of a delicate situation. We have two big questions that we need to deal with. One, okay, we've kicked the Spanish out of Cuba, now what happens with Cuba? And the other big question was the Philippines. Remember the Filipinos had been fighting against the Spanish because they wanted to be independent. Well, the Spanish were gone in the Philippines, but who had replaced them? The we did. And the Filipinos didn't necessarily want us there either. So what begins in uh, 1899 is actually another war in the Philippines, where the Filipino insurrectionists, the Filipino uh, revolutionary leaders, men like Aguinaldo and others, begin to fight now against the United States. Certainly the fact that you know, we, we kept the Filipinos out of the uh, surrender of Manila didn't sit well with them, but the fact that we were now occupying their country, we were now the imperialist power there, certainly was not something that the Filipinos were happy with. So what occurs is three years of difficult, bloody warfare in the Philippine Islands as the United States is trying to suppress this rebellion and the Filipinos are fighting against the United States for their own independence. Uh, we see a couple of scenes of that going on in the photographs there. And that cartoon on the right demonstrates the situation. What it shows is Uncle Sam beginning work on a temple of knowledge to bring to the Philippine Islands. But what happens in the Philippines? You have that giant volcanic eruption in the background the outbreak of the Filipino insurrection. Now, interestingly, one of the American um, military officers in the Philippines was a commander of forces in the Philippines, was a general by the name of Arthur MacArthur. His son, Douglas, would become very closely tied with the later history of the Philippines, particularly during the Second World War. Uh, Douglas MacArthur does have a long, complex tie with the Philippine Islands. In any case, by 1898, we've defeated the Spanish, we've acquired this global empire, though we're trying to suppress this, this uprising in the Philippines and trying to figure out what we're going to do with Cuba at this point. Uh, we, do end, we do head into 1900, and 1900 is a presidential election year. And you have William McKinley, who is tremendously popular now because of the successful completion of the, um, the, the Spanish-American War, running for re-election. McKinley has a problem. His problem is that his vice president, Go, uh, Garrett Hobart, had died in office. We all remember Garrett Hobart, right? Yeah. Had died in office the previous year in 1899. So he needed a new vice presidential running mate. He needed somebody to, to fill that second spot on the ticket. As it happens, in New York State, there was a newly inaugurated young governor, a uh, man who's 40, 41 years old, by the name of yeah. Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had parlayed his fame in the Spanish-American War to the governorship of New York State the following year. And now there's a vacancy as the vice presidential running mate for, um, for William McKinley. Now, when Roosevelt becomes governor of New York, he wants to be a reform governor. He wants to clean up New York State politics, which, of course, doesn't sit well with most New York State politicians who had uh, controlled politics and achieved their position through graft and bribery and, and favoritism and that sort of stuff. Roosevelt wants to get rid of all of that. So when McKinley needs a running mate, it's the New York State politicians, the Republican Party in New York State that say, hey, we know just the guy for you. Take Teddy Roosevelt. Now, why would the Republicans in New York want to do that? Get rid of him. To most people, the vice presidency was a dead end job. You go to the vice presidency and you're become a historical footnote. Um, and that's what they hoped would happen to Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> so Roosevelt is nominated for the vice presidency. McKinley easily wins re-election as president. Teddy Roosevelt becomes vice president of the United States in 1901. Uh, that would prove to be a, a bad miscalculation by the New York State politicians, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. This uh, political campaign poster from that election 
kind of compares America before and after, if you will. Prior to McKinley's election here in 1896, you see uh, America gone democratic, having a democratic president, and the factories are all shut down. People are making a run on the bank. They're taking the money out of the banks, and there is Spanish rule in Cuba. Look at these emaciated Cubans all in prison. Well, what happens four years later? You have thriving American industry. You have people depositing money in banks, and look at Cuba educated and prosperous because of the United States. So McKinley uses this to easily, easily win re-election in 1900. He is off on a second term. In the meantime, there is the question of, well, what do we do with Cuba now? You remember that Teller Amendment that said, we, the United States, don't want any control over Cuba. We're going to establish law and order, and that's it. By 1901, sentiment in Congress had changed somewhat. And the question of Cuba Libre became more debatable. What we see in 1901 is that uh, Senator Orville Platt from Connecticut, this gentleman right here, um, offers an amendment to a financing bill that's making its way through Congress. It comes to be called the Platt Amendment. And what the Platt Amendment deals with is specifically the American role in Cuba. The Platt Amendment, you can see some excerpts from it over here, essentially gave the United States a free hand in Cuba. It said that the government of Cuba shall never enter into any treaty or other compact with any foreign power or powers which will impair or tend to impair the independence of Cuba. So Cuba will, will say you're independent, but you can't make treaties with anybody because it might impede your independence. That the government of Cuba consents that the United States may exercise the right to intervene for the preservation of Cuban independence, the maintenance of a government adequate for the protection of life, liberty, and individual li uh, in life, liber property, and individual liberty. So the United States has the right to intervene in Cuba whenever we see fit. The Cuban government is, is agreeing to that. And finally, that to enable the United States to maintain the independence of Cuba and to protect the people thereof, as well as for its own defense, the government of Cuba will sell or lease to the United States uh, lands necessary for coaling or naval stations. So we're going to establish naval bases on the island of Cuba. All of this was part of the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment makes its way through Congress and is signed into law in the United States. It is eventually forced on the Cuban people and ratified in the Cuban Constitution in 1903. In 1903, Cuba is technically independent, but the United States retains the right to intervene anytime we want, and we establish naval bases on the island. Now, do we still have naval bases on the island of Cuba? Yes. Guantanamo Bay. Ever wonder why? You can thank Orville Platt from Connecticut for that. Uh, we have been leasing Guantanamo Bay from the Cuban government since 1903. Um, even during Castro's reign over the island, supposedly we, we send the Cuban government a nice check every year and the Cuban government fails to, to cash that check. But we are paying for lease on Guantanamo Bay and we have had a naval base there for over a century as a result of the Platt Amendment, as a result of the Spanish-American War. Well, the Platt Amendment does become a defining aspect of our relationship with Cuba. Um, it isn't until the 1930s that we actually modify that arrangement a little bit with uh, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, good neighbor policy. In any case, what happens? William McKinley, easily re-elected in 1900, begins his second term in 1901. Teddy Roosevelt set to become a footnote to history, except in September of 1901, was McKinley is assassinated. Uh, McKinley is in Buffalo, New York attending a uh, Pan-American exhibition that is being held there. And he is greeting well-wishers in the Temple of Music, people coming up, shaking the president's hand. We have to remember that presidents had very minimal security at this point. And as uh, well-wishers are coming and shaking the president's hand, one man approaches him, has his hand wrapped in what appears to be a bandage. <laughs> Inside that bandaged hand, he was holding a pistol. As uh, McKinley stretches his hand out to, to shake, he is shot in the stomach twice. He lingers for several hours and dies early the next morning. When McKinley dies, as we see there on the front page of the Buffalo Inquirer, um, who becomes president? Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. The man who New York politicians hoped would disappear now becomes the most powerful politician in the land. Uh, a man whose political rise is accelerated in part because of his participation in the Spanish-American War. And that uh, is really the story of that splendid little war.
that conflict between the United States and Spain that ultimately, though again a brief conflict, was a conflict that was world-changing. Brought about the end of one empire, the emergence of another empire, and radically changed American politics. So that's the uh, Spanish-American War. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes? I once heard a theory that American interest in the Philippines was founded on the need for rubber, at least leading up to World War II. Was that on the scene, or, or let me say, when did that come out on the scene? Rubber becomes a hugely important commodity uh, in the second Industrial Revolution, so the second half of the 19th century, 1880s, 1890s, uh, because it's one of the, the materials that was used in a lot of different industrial production and for a lot of in, uh, different industrial needs. And what we see are that certain European countries were certainly benefiting from controlling areas where rubber could grow. Rubber is a tropical plant. It needs warmth and, wet, uh, and wetness. Uh, we see certainly uh, Belgium establishing their empire over the Congo uh, and, the, and the brutality that goes along with that. That was basically to exploit the rubber production there. We see the same thing with the French in their interest in Southeast Asia, which becomes French Indochina. Rubber plantations are established there. So certainly the d desire for rubber may have played a role in the uh, American involvement or the American desire for the Philippines. Uh, it's in the right kind of geographic area and it was an important product. I don't know how well um, rubber would actually grow in the Philippines, but it was probably, um, might have been one of the underlying reasons that we were involved there. Somebody else had their hand up, I thought. Everybody was asking about rubber. Okay. <laughs> uh, Spanish-American War, I believe the Oregon was a new battleship that just came out. She had to go all the way around the Horn to get into the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And in the Navy's point of view, this was untenable. That was one of the motivating factors for eventually building the Panama Canal. Um, you have to remember, if you were trying to go from Boston to San Francisco in 1880, how did you do it? You sail all the way down the, the, west, the east coast of the Americas and then turn around the Cape of Good, uh, the Horn of uh, South, the Straits of Magellan, which are incredibly uh, dangerous waters, and then sail all the way up the west coast of the Americas. A long, treacherous journey. It could take six months to make that journey. The other option you had was, of course, going across the continent. You could do it by foot or on horseback or by the 1880s by train, but that wasn't really good for moving large numbers of people or equipment. So it was very difficult to get to, from one side of the United States to the other side of the United States. And building a canal somewhere in the middle, the skinny part of the Americas, would have facilitated it, made it much easier, which is why there was the, the pressure on McKinley to do so. Obviously, McKinley doesn't get it done, but who does? Teddy Roosevelt is the guy who begins the process of building the Panama Canal. Uh, that story in and of itself is a fascinating piece of history that involves um, the study of medicine and infectious disease and engineering, uh, engineering feats. Have any, of you, have any of you been to the Panama Canal? The Panama Canal is not like a, a ditch across land. It's not just digging a ditch. You actually had to move ships up over mountain range and then back down on the other side. So it took a tremendous amount of engineering, the building of locks and, and canals and artificial lakes and figuring out how to prevent the landslides and how to keep the mosquitoes from killing everybody that was working there. It's a massive, massive undertaking that you know, probably could not have been conducted in the 1890s. Uh, it had to wait until the early 20th century before we had the tools necessary to do that. But it was done because of its strategic necessity, because we could move naval vessels back and forth easily. Supposedly, the width of the Panama Canal when it was first built was uh, decided by the maximum width of American battleships so that we could get those through there. Uh, it, of course, becomes economically important because you can conduct trade very quickly uh, back and forth um, from East Coast to West Coast through the Panama Canal. So um, I don't remember where I started that conversation, but the Panama Canal, big deal. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thanks a lot. I hope you found that enjoyable, and I will see you next time. <laughs>